Mario is a is an artist based in Munich. That's so, correct. So he lives close. He's back from holidays, so he's very relaxed. It's his first appointment after the holidays. Um, I say it again, beer is in the fridge, that Alfred Weidinger is happy with me, the museum director. Mm, and yeah, we let's start the conversation. Um, I think the two of us have met, which year was it in Paris? 2018? I'm always so bad with years, but it must be like uh, four, four years ago, so something around that. Yes, it was during my residency at Google Arts and Culture. Yeah, we met there and it was a huge press conference and there were many artists presenting uh, work and yeah, that's how we met in front of your work, I think. Yes, um, I believe so, yeah. And it was also the, the time when Hans Ulbricht didn't, didn't see me. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was there too. But yes, so uh, the work that was there was at that time, I think, X Degrees of Separation, which actually I think I, I have a little picture. So... Yeah, I don't have a presentation, so let's uh, go to AI and uh, uh, let's just see where it is. And uh, to, to, oh yeah, because yeah, we decided to keep this spontaneous, and uh, so I have to search around a little bit and with the mouse. So let's see. Yeah, we didn't want to limit ourselves on what we oh, can speak about. Oh, it's not even there. Yes. So anyway, well, so X degrees of separation was kind of what got me that, uh, that residency at Google Arts and Culture. I had been already working with uh, kind of image classification and, and archives. So I was always interested in kind of finding obscure data. I think it's actually in data. That's why. Um, so yeah, actually that's, that's a good example. So I had previously been working with uh, kind of discarded data. In this case it was uh, something by the British Library Collection who had kind of all these scans from books automatically by a robot uh, uploaded to Flickr. The problem was all the data was uh, like unclassified. So in the sense uh, you had the chance to discover something there which uh, because you couldn't search by name so you had to go through each image and there were totally boring ones and very interesting ones and so when I found that collection that also got me into kind of uh, like, okay, now I have to really learn machine learning because uh, going through a million of images manually is something you can simply not manage. And so I started then by using the early models which did some basic classification and then used them to find stuff. And that was on Twitter and then somebody at Google saw this and said, oh yeah, we are working also with a lot of arc like museums and art and do we want to do something with this? And uh, that is, of course, was a fantastic opportunity because at that time Google had all the cool tech. tech. <laughs> so the, especially when it came to images, like their image search algorithm. And uh, so I proposed them, okay, I would like to try out if I can kind of find connections between any types of images, uh, like in their collection, in the same sense like the, the principle of ex, uh, six degrees of separation where everything is connected to any, everything else via a certain amount of steps. And so, so the idea is you use a classifier for every image, like a neural one, which captures kind of theoretically superficial features as well as deep ones and then see what happens if you connect them all by their similarity and that's similarity is, is one of the big themes I also in my work because like the question what do we see as similar what is related and so and then yeah this is then x degrees you start with an image and you end with an image and then the algorithm finds a pathway through from uh, using kind of what the machine sees. So it's also that question like, what do the machines see? Is that the same as we perceive an image or an artwork? Uh, does it capture also deeper meanings or is it only staying on shapes and forms and colors? And so the installation then allowed people to pick any start and end point. And again, the idea is that it's also based about attention. So 
if you have access to millions of images and, well, a, a search box that, uh, well, where it's like, yeah, you can go anywhere. Where do you start? And you usually just start by what you already know. So if you have the kind of lots of art, then, uh, well, people usually go, oh, yeah, let's try a Van Gogh or let's try something I already know. And you just probably encounter like 5% of what's there because you don't even know what to, what to ask for. So what X Degrees does is you can start with two known concepts, but it will give you a route which hopefully makes you discover things that have been discarded or neglected. And at the same time also kind of makes these interesting juxtapositions there where yeah you skip uh, across times and media and, uh, and cultures and uh, can always kind of try to figure out yourself if you find the juxtaposition interesting or might want to explore deeper into, like discover an artist or discover something. Like I'm personally not very interested in vases, but like this is, no. <laughs> so, so I try to get interested in things that I'm not interested in in the first place. I find that always uh, kind of trying to overcome my own prejudices uh, against boring stuff. <laughs> yeah, so. that's great. And uh, you've just uh, said prior that you had to actually learn how to work with, you know, use machine learning. Yes. So, uh, I mean, everything you do, you just said, well, sometimes you're not interested in things, but then you still proceed with it because that's also what, what that you probably don't get bored as an artist. And also with what Manuel has done, I, I know that you taught yourself like pretty much everything you're doing and that you're still learning like every day. Uh, when you work on things. So how was it for you? When, when did you decide to become an artist and when knew you are one? Oh no, maybe, maybe they, wait, that's uh, with you, I know that's a different story. So let, it put, let me put it differently and then we get to that question. Um, yeah, when did you start like working with computers and, and uh, understood that there's something creative uh, you can do with it? Okay, so I I'm like, yeah, I started, uh, like I grew up in the, like I was born 1970, so I always say I'm part of the first generation of children who kind of grew up with the digitization of the world because uh, that's like, it started with handheld little computer games, uh, pocket calculators, <laughs> and uh, then the first home computers. So, and all that was kind of, just emerging, and I always like beginnings when things are still kind of, uh, you're not sure where it goes. And so probably also because of my, my family history, my, my father worked as an engineer who also, they had computers in their offices and big plotters, and that was a big fascination. I played whatever moon landing on a green terminal. So I got very early exposed to this, all this new technology, and uh, I think one thing I always loved was kind of the power that you have by just pressing a single button or something and then you make things move or then uh, something bigger happens. So it's almost like that lever thing, like you make a, a t tiny effort and you create, produce some, some avalanche or things. So I think that's, children find that always fascinating. So I love the German Museum, Deutsche Museum, where you had all these dioramas and press buttons and then of course, computers gave you more power and then being able to program them yourself gives you also this immense ca yeah, capabilities to create anything that you can think up. And uh, I felt the way programming works was very close to how I like working in the sense that uh, I can always undo, I can correct mistakes, I can copy paste and uh, because I'm also very lazy so I, I hate having to do something that's why, you more have than a once. that's why you have a robot as an assistant but yes. we'll speak about that later. I do, uh, yeah. so anything, I hate having to do things twice, I also hate <laughs> having to tell people the same thing twice so it's like if it's said, if it's written then why kind of go on and on about it so and I think that's also in my art actually so I don't see the point of, of repeating myself like if I made the point then that's there so unfortunately well maybe we come later to that it's not how it works so Anyway, so from comp programming, uh, 
I got hooked as a teenager and started then exploring by, well, hacking games, uh, making simple stuff on a plotter. I, yeah, even then I, I had the plotter, so I always liked being able to output something interesting, beautiful. I also did photography, so um, I, and I even had my own dark room, and I, even then I liked being able to kind of make something with images that I cannot simply do by taking a picture. So in the dark room, experimenting with uh, kind of development techniques or multiple exposures, putting stuff on it. So really like, but because then the computers were not really able to do that. And well, when I was then done with school, I was looking around for like, how can I continue to do that? And unfortunately, didn't find anything that uh, fit that. Because yeah, again, we're talking about early 90s and uh, I don't know, there was no internet, very important to know. So I could not just enter something in Google like where in the world can I kind of make computer art or so. So, and also I didn't read yet know that I wanted to be an artist, I think. So, I mean, it sounded like, I don't know, it, it's, it was more, I wanted to make interesting things, but, uh, and I was looking at art school, but uh, it, it didn't seem like uh, I had the right qualifications. I, I, I never liked to paint, and uh, I, yeah, I was maybe also too naive in just saying, okay, here I am, here's my computer, take me. So that took me some longer time to figure out that, uh, probably you could have gotten away with it. So in the end, I just made my way through. Being good at computers at that time meant that I, there was always something to do. I made techno flyers using my self-programmed Photoshop filters, which again, at that time there was the term generative art didn't exist, but in hindsight I say, I wrote these filters which were parametric, so it was in a sense uh, algorithmic art, and, uh, but I just used them to create pretty, very colorful stuff. I don't have an example of that with me, but... Uh, I just yeah. wanted to ask for it. But can uh, you show well, it to me at another point? Hmm? Can you show it to me? We, you could, I might have shown you. So in the end, yeah, but it was perfect timing. Maybe you can timing. tweet it, was, it later. I can show you to them later. But yeah, it was perfect coincidence because back then techno was, of course, uh, they always needed something that was out of this world and looked, uh, looked digital and crazy. And so I could do whatever I want. So in a sense, the working was already artist-like, but uh, it was, I didn't see it as art. So in the end, uh, yeah. You've just mentioned computer art. And uh, when Herbert W. Franke got active on Twitter, you were the first artists who got really, who saw it and then got really excited about it and told everyone, you know, follow him, he's a legend and so on and so on. And you kept sharing the books you own and then you've met him here when we opened the solo show. Uh, I think that was in, when was it? April, March? Um, so yeah, when did you find out about his books, his works? And then I guess because through that one can learn, well, there's such a thing as computer art and I know Uh, two weeks ago, I met Frida Nake. He's also one of the pioneers, and I also asked him, "Well, do you do you consider yourself as an artist?" And that's still quite a tricky question for him. He was like, "Well, I let other people decide about that." He's so. Huh. Oh, the, uh, let, let me get to that point first. So that yeah. was always my attitude too. So let other people decide, mm -hmm. and that's why I never called myself an artist until I don't know the 2000 and. 12, 13 rounds. So I had always some other terms like computational artisan. So in a way I wanted to be an artist, but I waited for people to, to call me an artist. And I think it's not how it works. So in the end, the moment I decided, no, 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 it's me who has to tell people I'm an artist, then, and then make them believe that, that's when things started working. But if you are kind of wake about it, that's simply how things work. Then they, you are just a computer nerd doing pretty pictures. So you have to, also, I mean, you get measured by different kind of standards. So if you claim you are an artist, you get measured by artist standards. If you just kind of a computer nerd, then you don't get taken serious and you also you have different uh, things you might want to say. So I guess I might have my questions kind of evolved, of course, over the time. But let's get back to Herbert Wifranke. So in the kind of 
2000s, I started kind of getting more serious about generative art, and uh, of course, it initially started with algorithmic art and all these processes, and then, of course, while you're doing that, in the process, you start, and the internet became better, so you came across kind of uh, the pioneers, and so I think very early on, I was starting to look for the roots, and uh, kind of went on eBay, I mean, at some point, you, you fi figure out who the pioneers were, and then I was, actually had searches on eBay out for, for all the books or all the names, and whenever something popped up, I got it. And especially Herbert Wifranke's book, uh, um, oh God. Computer <laughs> graphics? Hmm? Computer graphics? Uh, no, 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 no. Actually, the Phänomen Kunst is oh. my favorite one, because that's kind of, kind of the whole theory. It's actually about, our perception of art and how does art work on uh, like on the information theoretical level and that was kind of for me the actually what what got me going so because they, they also it came at the time when I was asking okay why is something art and why something is not can we just look at an image and decide like why is this uh, i don't know a sports picture from a newspaper and when we look at the other one we immediately say oh this is art so that was kind of my starting point and so all the theory like about kind of why this happens is in this book and so that's kind of one of my bibles so it's, a, it's kind of Kubernetes aesthetic, like also why do we see something as beautiful, interesting actually, interestingness is one of those keywords. So, and so I think, let's say my benefit is that I now live in a time when all the theoretical ideas that Herbert Wifranke and Abraham Moles and uh, had already in the in the 60s about can we measure aesthetics, can we measure the semantic contents of images with machines, it was simply technically not possible because you need actually neural networks and uh, to cover, like get into the deeper layers of this. And so in a sense, I, I feel like I'm carrying on the torch with the technology we have available now and love making all these discoveries. And well, we all see the, where we are now with AI and uh, that pretty much all he wrote and the, uh, is, is correct. <laughs> so I, I'm still kind of uh, convinced that you can actually measure all these things, even if people hate it. Like uh, even emotional and uh, the, like the kind of reactions that art will bring mm -hmm. up in us. And of course, similarities again, because again, it's about similarities and it's all kind of relative to what you know, what others know, yeah. And yeah, as you've mentioned, he was correct with probably everything, but he was so ahead of his time that people simply yes. had no clue what he was writing about and couldn't understand it. And I mean, that radically changed over the past year. And what I found like really interesting was, I mean, he had after 48 hours, 10K, 10,000 followers on Twitter. And it was so interesting, there were like 50% of the people already knew him, and then the other 50% were like, oh wow, that's super interesting, I'm happy to learn about it. And then there were artists who then started looking at his work and his career, and then some of them were like, oh, uh, oh, he had done like 30, 40 years ago what I'm just trying to do now, and basically understood, that's also what Kevin A. Bosch then said, well, basically, he had really done, like, except when it comes to AI, everything that you can do with technology, that's why so much of the work that's been created now looks similar, which was quite fascinating. Um, and yeah, but I think that was not probably, I mean, him now being recognized for what he had done, I think is also possible because through the hype around NFTs, as annoying it might be, because speak, people speak too much about money instead of art, and then it's all about some uh, cartoon monkeys, whatever. Mm, but I think it make, made people aware that there's more more to this and that there's even like you've just said when you wanted to were thinking about making art you were like ah, art schools and then you were like no they use canvases and brushes and that's not what you want to do right and through the hype around nfts people understood you or more people than people who are aware of arts electronica and so on understood the importance of media arts and digital art 
Uh, what has changed? I mean, you were also known within the community prior to the NFT hype as one of the leading artists. But what has changed for you through the hype around NFTs as an artist? You were very early on, for example, a big um, supporter and like really excited about the green blockchain Tezos. And also thanks to you, I think there's such a huge community on, on the chain. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what has changed? So. Uh, initially, I was rather skeptical about uh, the whole blockchain thing. So when it started, like, uh, when was that? Like 2017, 18 or so? Like when, when NFTs started? Yeah, I, or I, 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 I'm so bad about numbers and, and, uh, and times, but so... 2018. 2018, yeah. yeah. So, and of course, my, my benefit was that... Uh, I had already realized that Twitter would become uh, like one of the important factors in getting noticed because uh, and so I had kind of already worked my, my way into sorry. How did you figure that out? Because hmm? how did you figure that out that it would no, be Twitter I mean, and not Instagram? No, I mean it kind of started earlier already. So it, let's say I figured out in the 90s that the internet would become pretty much the sole source of information for for everybody to find anything about, uh, out about uh, or discovering people. So uh, also curators <laughs> so so where do curators get their information from hey, i mean I'm, of course I, they I meet other at google hmm? i met you at google see okay you met me at google but i mean yes so but there's I knew two you things prior. there's friends there is uh, kind of face-to-face uh, -face meetings and yeah. maybe books but the internet surely plays more and more of a role so it's again about information flow mm -hmm. and so with the internet becoming so important, I worked very early on that I made sure that people would find me. So that's kind of my way of hacking in. And at the same time, of course, it's not something by just SEO, but you have something to have something interesting to say. And uh, so when the NFT stuff started, I already had an, a name out there and enough followers. So I had an easy start, you could say. And I already had kind of made my way into the art world. So I already had like, my, my Sotheby's auction and several exhibitions with my AI stuff. So it was actually, and that's when kind of super rare and the NFT stuff started. I looked at it and was very kind of like saying, really? Uh, <laughs> I kind of made it already a little bit in and now I don't want to ruin my reputation by having kind of my art shown next to some blinking horrible stuff that I didn't understand. So I said no when they actually asked me if I wanted to be part of their yeah, new site. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. That's what I, um, I, I didn't know about that part, but that's quite interesting because then you sort of like really consider a platform such as Super Rare or Nifty Gateway or Foundation more like a gallery with a program because if you think of it as a platform like Spotify, um, you're not like, oh, wait, I don't want to be on Spotify, I don't like this hip-hop stuff, or I don't like classic music, I don't want to see myself next to it, so you really consider these platforms, because when an artist is asked, well, do you want to join the, the gallery and be represented, they look at the roster, right, at the, the artist one represents, so interesting. Yeah, uh, I mean, in the end, yeah, so... It was probably a mistake in hindsight, but at that time it was just, it felt it, it was not for me. So I already, and at that time it was also not obvious that this would become such a hype, right? So stuff sold for a hundred dollars and people were happy and I had just sold kind of, I don't know, what was it, Memories of Passers By for, what was it, 60,000 pounds? So it felt like... Uh, also, like, which is kind of like not a good thing, right? Like uh, starting that quickly, but it was also like irresponsible towards collectors to say, okay, but now I'm doing NFTs and I sell it for a hundred dollars. So, anyway, so I, I waited, I, I watched it, and uh, so a year later, already kind of the hype picked up. Mm -hmm. So my funny, okay, I don't know, maybe I tell it, yeah. So. So this is actually kind of my first, like, I only have that screenshot, I don't know if you can, uh, how would I do a full screen? So that was my, my first NFT, I minted on Rarible, and I went to Rarible because I, I kind of wanted to try it out and they didn't have a vetting, so anybody could mint there. And uh, I did it out of spite. 
So <laughs> kind of funny. So story is that uh, Max Osiris, I don't know, you, you might have, uh, might know his name, sure. kind of little rascal. We had so. him on a Twitter space. Ah, uh, yes. You've also been part of our, no, you haven't, we still need to do the AI one. And yeah, so it was, we had a, yeah, yeah, it was like noisy. Okay, so <laughs> what he did, he had taken one of my AI artworks, which I had posted on Twitter, and which was also part of an installation, and made a remix out of it, for which in his eyes was a remix, and then minted it on Super Rare, and afterwards came up to me and, and said, hey, I, I made a remix of your work, don't you like this? And then I saw it, and it, well, to me it looked like, okay, so you took 90% of my image and put a little kind of crappy thing up there and I said no actually maybe you should have asked me before uh, please take it down and then he didn't understand that and said no well it's a remix I can do whatever I like and I said no you can't <laughs> and then well I went to Super Rare and asked them can you please take down this NFT but unfortunately what they did is uh, they actually banned him from the platform, which was not my intention, but uh, so it was kind of an early, I think, funnily enough, this has become part of his legend now, that he got the, was the rebel that uh, kind of uh, was uh, kind of banned because some evil copyright guy. So anyway, sorry, short story, long story short, a year later, when Rarible came out, he announced that he would kind of just mint it again. So I said, okay, what is this rareable thing? And I already kind of had prepared a little installation there, which I called Poison Pill. And so my first NFT was actually a performance. And so the idea was whoever bought this work could then kind of have the, like almost like a ticket to trigger me to start a performance in which I would ban somebody, well, <laughs> on like, on Twitter, like uh, block them and record the whole thing as a video, and uh, so, and then send them the the recording of the video. And uh, then there was a second one that was called Antidote, and that was kind of the way to undo this. And the trick was that uh, Poison Pill was I don't know I think five ether, and Antidote was ten ether. So the idea was, uh, well, hopefully he would have bought it, but of course I. And so in the end, somebody bought it and sent the, set the trigger, but then it was the start of COVID, and I felt too vain because my hair was already so long <laughs> that I didn't want to be seen on video like this. So in the end, I sent the money back and, and okay. kind of... So it never happened, uh, but yeah, that was my entry. But at the same time, I started really enjoying this, and I started minting stuff and f realized, okay, it's actually better than I thought. And... Uh, well, then I just kept on minting, first on Rarible and then on Super Rare, kind of a mixture of some old works, some, but I also like to kind of make, well, what I might call conceptual works. I don't know if you want, like, one of my favorite ones uh, still is, I think, this one. Oh, sorry, that's another one. Uh, nope, another, ah! Oh, that's your conversation with Jerry? Uh, well, there's, there's, there's a very, okay. Uh, where is it? So it's actually, well, the, the better one, I think it was this one, yeah. So can you read that? So this was kind of the famous right-click safe. So with, uh, so this was that tweet where somebody said like, okay, now I took a screenshot of your NFT and now I own it. So it was kind of this, haha, -ha, NFTs oh, yeah. are not worth anything. So when I saw this, I kind of replied. Uh, I screen wrapped your tweet and now I sell it. And then I minted it and it is sold out immediately. So it was kind of my, my way of first marking a point in time. I always like the blockchain also as a kind of a flag that you can set at a certain time and also yeah, keeping it for, for posterity. And how then I repeated that later on in, in, in some How sometimes. much did it sell for? Uh, well, I think it wasn't that. I had an edition of 10, and I think each one was at $200 or something like that in the equivalent. So it wasn't. I, of course, wanted it to sell. I mean, I, I priced it that it would sell. I mean, the whole point is that somebody would have bought it. Actually, Art Gnome bought the first one. Oh, great. Like, uh, yeah. So kind of performance, uh, payback. And of course, yeah, then I used this uh, also as another tool to mark moments in time. So this was when Jerry Saltz for the first time mentioned NF NFT on Twitter, 2021. Okay. 
And so again, like, what is an NFT? And I say, let me demonstrate with a practical example. So I like sometimes also to be clever. <laughs> and then with Tezos, we were talking about Tezos, right? So yeah, I don't know, you want me to go on? Yeah, sure. I and, mean, uh, yeah. yeah, but that's also interesting. I mean, um, what's the name of the artist? I forgot. The appropriation artist. Can have someone help who, who then commented on women's... Uh, Prince? Richard Prince. Yeah, Richard Prince. Yeah, exactly. So he has basically done the same, sort of like same thing on Instagram, commenting on, on women's uh, postings. And then he minted it? Uh, no, he did not mint them. He uh, sold them at, I think, a Gaussian. Exhibited and exhibited. That's always the problem, he right? Just so wrote a comment, and then that was his piece, and then put it on the can and on a canvas, and people were really angry. Oh, I, I remember you that remember one. Yeah, that was that really. Ang well, in this case, I didn't want no, to make fine. anybody angry. It was more kind of almost like I like also these self-referential. I like feedback loops mm -hmm. and things that are kind of meta in a sense. So, and that felt kind of the collision of the old art world with a kind of potentially new one and of course Jerry is of course the expert in uh, like he invented attention economy almost like before like so so I, I found that very fitting as a kind of an example of when when the art world discovered NFTs so yeah, that, that was also around the time you were part of a show I curated yeah and then possibly. you really liked it, the Decentraland exhibition I curated you you were part of the artists online with a with a piece from yourself And he actually praised it. Happy to hear that, yeah. Because earlier on, like in the AI tapes, he kind of also ripped one of my, like uh, he said like, oh, there was this wise video thing where he looked at AI art and hated everything. Unfortunately, mine was in there as well. Kind of under false pretenses, somebody had asked, oh, can we use one of your works in our, in our video? And nobody told me what it was about. So anyway, but as long as they spell their, your name right, right? That's the thing. <laughs> but, it's, but it's interesting that prior we heard, uh, no, that wasn't today, that was yesterday, uh, Jonas Julund and his artistic practice with the shareholders, but still, you know, figures from the art world and basically everyone who buys a Jonas Lund token. And here we are in the age of sort of like Web3 and decentralization. You've mentioned prior Hans Ulrich Obrist, now we're here speaking about Jerry Souls. So it's still. Of course, it's, it's kind of like it's, for it's you how the game artist. works. So in the end, you well, can't ignore them and uh, they are part of the whole system and you kind of have to almost like, uh, what are these called? Like pilot fishes and the big sharks and then you try to swim next to them. <laughs> so, <laughs> mm. That's a very oh, by the way, there's also uh, uh, Jerry Salt's... Oh, which one? Oh, yeah, yeah, the, the collector, yeah, yeah, the big French collector. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, that one, yeah, what was the, oh, yeah, there was the what the fuck, right? Or, oh, sorry. sorry. Oh, no, that was not the one. But, yeah, that was part of that, uh, yeah. yeah. So it's just about, you know, the, yeah. to comment about the other person in the, in the tweet, Alain Servet, who is a very well-known traditional art collector. Yes. Oh, no, <laughs> so, and he hates NFTs, like, yeah, exactly. uh, like he absolutely <laughs> hates it. So, yeah, I found that kind of nice, too. <laughs> so, But yes. w what we learned a couple of days ago, that Uber Morgan prior to NFTs, so the NetArt icons, Uber Morgan, Uh, prior to NFTs, only sold three pieces, three of their pieces, and one of their collectors is Allah. So he he, he's, he's in now. Yeah. So I Finally, people him. come in. <laughs> I follow him and always find From it very interesting. Life. And uh, so, well, I mean, that's again, like the <laughs> tension is important, otherwise, it wouldn't be kind of uh, relevant. So, oh, so we're, we're talking about Tezos. So, actually, I think this is Jerry Salt's first NFT. So, of course, it's called the unsolicited, but the beauty about Tezos is that anybody who has a Twitter account also has a wallet. And so when he said that and I kind of added my clever, like in the future everybody will an NFT collector. So that was already a bit later, right? It was uh, a month later and then Tezos, kind of the whole Hickel Nunk thing had started. And then I said, yeah, for 15 minutes. Uh, I, oh, sorry, so sometimes yeah, I, yeah, can't, yeah. I can't help. But so I, I minted two editions and actually Jerry has one in, in a wallet he probably doesn't know exists, but uh, I like that. So that was also kind of like bringing it over to Tezos. So maybe we should get into the whole Tezos Yeah, tell thing. me about Tezos because okay. when I invited you to the, to the show last year at Koenig Gallery, which was on view in Decentraland at the, at the gallery, yeah, you immediately told me about 
uh, Tezos. Yeah, right. I wanted to mint there. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, I think you basically onboarded like the whole NFT space. That's what you're also name, known for, at least in the space, that you're the one onboarding like everyone. Uh, okay, well, I'm in a good position. So that's kind <laughs> of, I had a good starting bit. But yeah, so I, let's go quick like a few months earlier because that the way I got interested in this was actually starting with the whole um, discussion th that uh, Memo Acton and uh, Kyle McDonald started about the ecological impact of proof of work yeah. chains and uh, well I was again a little bit angry because uh, they had built this wonderful site where you could put any artist on a stake so there you could search for any artist mint in NFTs and then you would get almost like this beautiful thing which says how much you burned the planet and of course people came and gave me my screenshot of uh, that how much CO2 I had produced. But, so I was not happy about it, but it was probably necessary and it made me th look for alternatives. But uh, at that time in, in, Mar in, when was it, September, October, uh, it wasn't around yet. Mm -hmm. But I had my eyes open and then through an accident I came across a tweet by somebody who says, oh, by the way, on Tezos there is NFTs too now. And I hadn't either heard of, uh, like I hadn't heard of Tezos yet, but uh, I had a look and discovered, oh, this looks nice. It works just the same way. I mean, there are no platforms yet, but uh, let's give it a try. And so I had actually a few days earlier, there was one platform where you could buy and sell colors and it just worked. And it was extremely convenient and cheap and uh, so I was looking for a platform, and that's when Hicket Nunk then started. Like was, and then I, so at that point, Hicket Nunk was not a marketplace. It was just a place where you could mint an NFT, and it would it an experimental thing. So it was just there, and uh, but there was no buy sell button. But I, I kind of did a test, saying like, okay, let let me try if this works, and then I tweeted about it. And then people asked me on Twitter, how can I buy this? And I said, well, uh, I don't know, maybe you just send me some Tezos and then I, you have to trust me, I send you the NFT. And I think in a few hours, the whole first edition was sold out. And I think because of my already well-established position in Twitter, having lots of followers, uh, kind of a lot of people of my kind of inner circle said, who also before were really against NFTs because of the ecological aspect, thought, okay, if Mario try, does it, then maybe it's not that bad. I don't know. And so when kind of then the site evolved and, and uh, the community started growing, I felt the need to kind of help the development along a bit. So one thing I did was kind of this addition of 500 free NFTs. So I just minted an NFT and back then there were no bots yet. So you could put them out and it was also a test in honesty because uh, the idea, well, theoretically somebody could have just taken all 500. I always also like this kind of mm. that maybe we can establish some culture there which is not the, so greedy. And again, this probably has driven like, think, okay, well, there's an NFT. I have heard NFTs are kind of big, so maybe it's worth to... So it was kind of my trick to make people go through the tedious process of that takes two minutes to install a wallet, but that feels in your head like, oh, it's a big, big leap. So a lot of people might have started and, okay, let me figure out how can I get a wallet so I can get this free NFT. And uh, again, so now it's... I, the, the benefit is now I'm getting royalties whenever it's being sold, even though it was given away for free. And it's also probably kind of a, a little memory because the whole community kind of events, it's really like uh, the party that everybody who was there was on and now people fondly remember. And what I liked about it also is well, that the, the premise was start, it started differently. It didn't start with the idea, let's make lots of money, but let's make lots of art. And uh, I think that spirit has still prevailed to some extent. But, uh, well, for the price that, of course, you can't sell NFTs on Tezos for millions, but only for maybe thousands. But uh, at the same time, the, I think the overall culture there is much nicer still. I need to write that down. Let's make lots of <laughs> I write that down now and then tweet it later. Go ahead. So and please. we just spoke on the balcony. Um, so 
um, you said you don't. I mean, we spoke about that some artists like actually drop a lot of NFTs, like some daily, some not daily, but like very often. And you also spoke about secondary royalties. So once you have also enough NFTs out and like a following and people interested in your work, then you basically can live uh, in, in best case scenario from your secondary royalties. But you said, and also I know that, and I was like, when is your next piece going to come out? You don't release that much work. And you also said you only do, like you've just said prior, right? And that was the same with Herbert. When he figured out something and, and knew he made a point, then he moved on and never looked back. So yeah, how I mean, is that it's for you? Of course, now, like, if you are successful in that space, and not everybody is, right? I mean, there's a small percentage of people who kind of are very successful, and then there are many, like, a big tail. And uh, so if you are, then you kind of have the license to print money. And uh, I, feel, I always feel that you have to be responsible with that kind of... And uh, there is always, of course, the, the, the temptation to say, okay, uh, uh, let me just look in my archive and mint something. But uh, I don't know, I don't want to over-abuse it. And uh, I also kind of uh, has this classic, uh, what is it, like mothers say this, like, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. I always like, if I don't have anything interesting to say, I rather don't. Mm -hmm. And so the same with uh, NFT. So I, yeah, I, I don't want, I don't feel like I have to drop something every month, every week or every day. And uh, I rather, it's, because also, yeah, it, it's, almost like playing with the hopes of your collectors or audience that uh, hopefully this the value goes up and uh, they kind of can double on their investment and uh, I don't know how often that really works out so me neither <laughs> so I don't sell I just collect so I've never sold a piece and I will I always say I only will sell an NFT if I can get a house for the money I can sell it for Yeah, so I also think rather long term. I also have kind of a large collection, but I think I never sold anything because uh, luckily I don't need to. I mean, some other people might need act. And for some people, it might even be great. Like if I drop something for, for 10 Tezos and somebody in the part of the world can sell it for 20 or 30. And uh, so f maybe they, they have kind of money for a week or I don't know. So in a way, dropping these and kind of like giving people who are really kind of have figured out the game a chance to to make money that way is, is fine but still i don't know i feel i only have to drop something if i have yeah something new to say or yeah so it's i don't like this mechanism of uh, which also comes of course with social media that you have to go on shilling and uh, all this Thank you, Orgies, just so your name pops up in, uh, in the Twitter. Uh, so there are these, all these side effects that I really don't like, and especially on social media where you can already feel that somebody is going to have a drop because they start replying to everybody and adding their comments to every little thing. And uh, so actually that was kind of my, my te like there, there's this uh, teletext thing where I was part of, and so yeah, I kind of, Uh, how you call it? Yeah, I reference these behaviors in a little bit. All oh, the the GM culture. I mean, it's yes, it's nice. There is kind of a, their own language, but I don't like it. So I I'm not a chatty, and so f it's great for others, but I it goes on my nerves, and I can't play that way. And so and the same thing. I also don't like to play the NFT game like it's best being played. So in order to maximize your your outcome, uh, your profits. But as you've just mentioned, you also don't have to do that because. I mean, we've met through Google in person, and you've, I mean, Herbert wrote books. I just wanted to say you write threads on Twitter. I think that's what all of us now do. So you always were speaking about art and thinking about, I don't know, whatever happens in the NFT space or whenever there's something new, then you try it out. So you always, you're, you're just there because some artists are naturally communicating 24 7 
on Twitter anyway, and you're one of them. So oh, not ah. Oh, well, okay. You, so you were on holidays <laughs> for like. So, uh, I, I have these uh, phases. I don't know. I would like to make a program which kind of is mapping my tweet frequency with uh, kind of projects that I'm currently working on. Usually, my tweet frequency goes up when I start procrastinating, and uh, so. Yes. When you see me tweeting a lot, that means I actually have to finish a deadline and then to kind of not doing it. So, but then there's also kind of, I don't know, on my holidays, I just didn't do it, which is really bad because the algorithm will kind of, uh, that, that in a way we are constantly fighting against the Twitter algorithm. And I feel like a lot of the behavior that we see is not because people want to do it, but mm. because the, that, damn algorithm is forcing us in, into this. And of course, then this shapes the whole culture of this space, which, uh, well, it's probably necessary. So, I mean, you, I know, for example, you love your Twitter spaces, like the voice stuff, and I absolutely hate them because I always feel, again, I like to be efficient. And No, uh, but you know why we did it? Sorry for interrupting you. I mean, there was like last year, mm, around November, December, uh, there were a lot of discussions happening which were a lot about bad faith arguments from one part of the Twitter space towards the other and then there was a traditional art world and there's people from the, uh, with a background from the traditional art world on, on Twitter and working with NFTs and then there were the PFP people and what everyone, it's at some point there, everyone was attacking everyone and then it got like, at some point it wasn't nice and then Mikola and I were speaking and, and were like, how can we change that, you know? Because we all have the same goals, right? We want to see more art, we want to see the space grow, uh, we want to have things happen like this, and then Mikola and I were like, yeah, let's just you know, bring people together, because there's way too many uh, misunderstandings if people just write, then you can't hear the voice and the tone, which is important, and then we started doing that. And I think it really helped that people, you know, they, they got to know each other, and everyone was just like, even if we don't agree maybe on one tiny detail, it's not an issue. It's not the end of the world. You don't have to fight. You don't have to hate the other person. You don't have to block them. And that's why we still keep doing it. And I think that these, uh, it's not, the, I don't see it anymore, the, 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 that kind of stuff. Because now all of us know each other. We've yeah. met at conferences. We know we're all like really friendly people. And that's, I guess, the one thing that's really great about the NFT space. Everyone's like really nice and really friendly. And that's not the case in the traditional art world. And then I was like thinking about it like last week and I was like, I know the reason. Because everyone is basically sort of like happy and can make enough money, right? And then you don't, don't have people being not happy and disappointed and struggle. But that's not the case. Everyone can make their art, everyone's, you know. So that's a very good reason and that's why I think the art, traditional art world had a problem with Raphael Rosendahl. He also had the same impression that one of the most important artists also with the background traditional art world, he was like, are you sure we actually want to bring in the art world? Because it's so nice just being among us. Everyone is nice. Do we really want to bring them in? And I was like, I don't know. Maybe then they also start being nice. I mean, when you put it like that, I totally see uh, a good reason to have spaces like that. I just feel there is kind of an abundance of unnecessary chatter where I always see the same people probably saying the same thing. I don't listen to them because it's kind of, I hate time-based media which force me to listen to the whole thing before I can figure out if it contains anything valuable and, uh, but. We have news now. There will, be, sure. mm. there will be a transcript of this talk. Excellent. We, so yeah, as long as we it's release it as text, as text, yeah. So in a way, again, like I like efficiency and like, uh, like what we all do is we add to the inf information of uh, civilization and if it's just audio it's kind of currently a little bit uh, kind of a hundred people might ever kind of so there is like the lifetime of I don't know ten people being uh, being used up to say hopefully interesting things but then it ends up where nobody will ever hear or read about it again so that's why if there's transcript that's good but usually it feels like there's like one percent something novel or important buried in 99% of just people shilling their project and telling me the same thing that I have heard like times and times before. So anyway, but in a way, in that sense, I'm old school. So I like, uh, I'm, that's why I think I'm not really made for that new generation. I, I like things. Uh, you're the leading of, voice of, the, of this new movement and you're like, 
Maybe I... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, but at the same time, it's fine. I mean, uh, I don't have to kind of be at every party and participate in everything. And I'm, I'm really happy that everything is working so well and having seeing all these new kind of connections and friendships and, and projects that come out of this. So, and of course, I'm kind of also uh, benefiting indirectly yeah, with my kind of OG status. Like, I still get called even though I say no to Twitter spaces and that's that's still nice. So yeah, occasionally I have to then add my voice to the to that communication thing. And we're going to transcribe this thing using an AI. Well, I'm we worried, worried about ab that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what, what the AI does. Oh, I didn't show any pretty pictures, but yeah, I guess it's not necessary. Okay. So. Yeah, I think oh, we, we have are to over already. My yeah, goodness. Yeah, because I have to, we really have to, I have to start the conversation with Lynn hirschman Leeson at uh, five sort of sharp because she only has like exactly 30 minutes. So questions, I would say Ma Mario is around. If you have questions, please um, ask him and we'll be back in seven minutes, I would say. And then Lynn hirschman Leeson at five sharp. Okay, cool. Thank you. Waffles, beer, everything.